Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Central Leadership Skills, the podcast. We have a brilliant guest for you today, Ms. Michelle Griffin. Now, she is a very unique, powerful version of herself, authentic version of herself. I think it's important that you sit back, tune in, grab that cup of coffee. Depending on the time of day, it might be a cup of wine. In fact, a glass of burgundy wine sounds really nice about now, but we'll forgo that. But let's go ahead and introduce you. Michelle, and let's have her tell a little bit about herself. And then I have a question that's going to pin her down a little bit more. So, Michelle, welcome. Thank you, Glenn. It's so great to be here. I'm sincerely honored to have an opportunity to talk to you more today and talk about some of the favorite things I like to talk about is authenticity and personal branding. Great. Cool. We're going to have a good time with this. So tell us a little bit about how you got involved in personal branding and just a little bit about your history. We don't need to know from two years on, two years old yeah. on up, but just a little bit as well. Yeah, no. Professionally speaking is usually how I introduce my background, but I've the last two decades, I've been in marketing and public relations. Most recently, I was an executive director for a long time of an, a member of the professional association in the insurance industry. And almost a year ago, I made my entrepreneurial dreams come true and retired from my job to become a marketing consultant strategist. And in the last year working with people, I realized, and I still do that. I absolutely love helping people, the people, you know, we're all people matter for an entrepreneur or business, but the impact is just so profound when I'm able to face-to-face help someone with their branding, their messaging, their marketing in an authentic way. So I've decided, even though you might hear what is personal branding, it's such a need. And that's why I'm here to help more people get their expertise and their message out in an authentic way. Because so many of us want and have this expertise and this thought leadership, but we A, don't know how to do it. We're scared of imposter syndrome. We're scared we're going to be seen as I'm narcissistic. And it's not that a personal brand is just you as the brand. But just like any good company brand, you don't promote yourself. You're just equipping yourself so you can equip yourself to help others. And that's what my definition of an authentic personal brand is being in service to help others. And that's what I'm advocating for. Well, I hate to say this. I'm going to steal this podcast for myself. I think it might be useful for me and for our clients, for me just to say, you're going to coach me now. I want you to coach me on all this. But before I have you coach me on this, I want you to share something with the audience and us about yourself that most people don't know. Wow. Most people don't know. And I've mentioned this as I was trying to become more authentic was being human and real and transparent is externally. It's like you met me at a networking event or whatever. You would think I'm completely extroverted. I absolutely love talking to anyone and everyone. Like I'm insanely curious. But the funny thing is, as I've stepped out and become a personal brand strategist, it is super hard for me to show up online and put myself out there because Mm. I'm actually very private. So if it's possible to be extremely extroverted and insanely private at the same time, that's me. So I struggle with that. So I can totally relate. And it really helps me be relatable and approachable to others who struggle with that. So I think that's kind of my secret sauce. Like I can get totally, most people are very opposite. They're okay. Not most people, but I've met many people who are okay being online because they don't have to be themselves. But when they come in person, they're introverted. So I'm the opposite. That's uh, that's good to know. I think it's a challenge for a lot of folks. It's okay. I'm okay in front of the room. I'm okay on all this, but you know what? My dad and I were talking the other day about the pandemic and the effect that it has is having on people being in all the time. And it dawned on me, I love it. I'm an introvert Although I can be an extrovert when I'm speaking or something like that, but I just prefer to be by myself. Yeah. And that just seems to work out. So that's good. That's interesting. I have to remember that sometimes when the next person asks me that question, I have that same answer for yeah. them. <laughs> so, totally. It's weird, but it's true. But the more we do anything, like you said, the more it becomes easier. As yes. a core, we're always going to be who we are. But with anything, just get those reps in and life gets a little easier in whatever yes. you're struggling with. Absolutely. So I've always been challenged by this word authentic. I hear that all the time. You know, you can go on Clubhouse, you can go on podcasts, and all oh, you got to be your authentic self. In your own words, what does that mean? Yes, I'm trying to kill buzzwords, like buzzwords and jargon, and I'm trying to define them because there's no better word, I guess there could be, but authenticity means being to you, you being real, 
approachable is how you are on person, how you are online. If you met me at a networking event next week, you're like, Michelle, you're exactly the same as on Zoom. So you're basically showing up as your human self. You're not trying to be polished and perfect because absolutely no one is, right? So you just be real. And that helps you attract the people you're meant to serve and who resonate with you. And that, so you'll be a fit. So being authentic shows people you're human because we want more human empathy, empathetic people these days, and we need it. And more brands, corporate brands, hopefully will be like that too, because there's a huge need for that. Anyway, it's just being your real self and all. I'm not saying you're going to curate, like over curate, like you're going to overshare it's so personal, but there's a way I call it being professional, which is a blend of being personable and professional. I live on LinkedIn and Clubhouse, so to speak. So when I'm personable, I'm going to do it in the context of being professional, obviously. And it's not me. Some people devote too much of their lives on Facebook. They put it out there. That's just not me, but maybe that's for them is a little, that's more their authentic self, but I try to do it as a nice balance, right? Because you need to be known for something too. So authentic means who you are, but in a professional setting, you want to be known for that one thing. So if you're sharing too much of your personal, then they don't know what you do. So there's always a fine balance, but in the end, it's just being who you are Say what you mean, what you say. The challenge I have, and say you can help with this question, is that when someone in a leadership position is being professional, that's great. But people like people that are like them. So they want to see that you're like them. They want to see that personal side. It's amazing how many people, because I've put them out there, my grandson, you know, how many people want to know about him and that and because they have a grandchild or something so we end up sharing that and that could be personal it can lead to the next step in the grandson daughter family ex-wife's wife i don't know it could lead to that whole ball game when you're saying being authentic in your personal branding draw me a real good kind of you know don't go too far but what's too far and what's not enough when it comes to saying a personal brand that fits a professional existent. To me, those two words don't are not the same. Personal, professional. Well, I mean, uh, and here's the thing: I want to try to align them because we want to show, like, how do you? Isn't it funny how we go to work and we put on these airs? And I get some professions are like that, right? Say you're on LinkedIn. I just want to show up and talk about stuff and be me without feeling prim and proper. I just want to be me so people respect me or respect me as a professional. But does that mean I need to completely change who I am? No. And at the same, how would you talk to someone if you go to the grocery store? You would be polite, professional, right? That's how you want to be. I don't know why when we go to work or whatever, we have to button up our suits and be this different person. And then we leave and then we're something else. So if you're a jeans and t-shirt kind of person, why not be a jeans and t-shirt kind of person? Now I get it on some context because listen, I was in legal insurance and those are very buttoned up profession. There's a way to show your personal side, show your humor. There's just a way it's, you have to find out who you are internally before you can be external. And that's what I work with my clients because they think, mm-hmm. oh, let's do this professional brand, but no, who you are, what are your, what's your comfort level? What's your vision, your values and mission? You have to know all those things. And then that will help you find your vision your value, and most importantly, your voice. Because how we show up online, we need to have our voice in check. We don't want to show up one day one thing and then the next day another trying things out. So when you do that deep, messy work, you realize I can share stuff, people like it. And so what I do is I tell my clients, like we're going to find some personal stories we weave in with a business perspective. So that's the way I like to mix the two. Does that make sense? Does that- Yeah, it it does, but it makes me start to think about you as in your specialty, what's the biggest challenge you have with your clients? You listed quite a few there, but what's the biggest challenge with clients trying to get a hold of this personal brand so they can use it to improve their career? First, they think they that they don't need a personal brand. They, for many reasons, they think their stuff speaks for themselves, that people just, they assume people know them, right? The biggest thing is first, they don't know how to show up online. They don't know who they really are. And you think about it when they go to a networking event and someone asks them what they can do, what they do, and they don't, it's complicated or there's too many, it's too long. So they don't really know a, who they are, how they want to show up or they do. It's just not working for them like it could. So in a sense, not as, as they could be. So what I do is come and help when we do an internal deep dive. Then we face the external messaging, right? So that's their branding. And to me, branding is the core messaging. 
not your logos, your fonts and all the pretty stuff that can come later, mm. but it's who you are. Just like a company would define their missions and values. Then they get to their product. Product is you. And then, then you define your avatar and all that. So we, you have to do that foundational stuff. So I would say the number one thing is people don't have that foundational stuff. They just go out and do stuff. It's all over the place. So we get them really in check of who they are and it's clarity. I help people find the clarity and then they get into their marketing. We align their marketing and then the visibility. Because the main thing is a lot of people have this incredible message, but they don't know how to define it and differentiate it. And so that's what I think. And then they have imposter syndrome too. A lot of people think, oh, who am I to say anything? I'm not an expert. I don't know how to do this. So I help them, I help them work on that too. I don't want to drop imposter syndrome because that's a big issue. You said you, well, clubhouse, how many rooms do we see a day on imposter syndrome? Uh, yeah. Another one of those catchphrases, which I don't like for people to label themselves that way, the imposter syndrome. But they do, and that's the catchphrase this day, these days. When it comes though to the clients that you're working with, or at what level does a client really find this beneficial? If you're a small mom and pop operation that has a web presence, is it been, it's beneficial, but at what level do they start approaching you and saying, hey, I have a multi-million dollar operation here. I need to clean this up. I need to do this. Is there a certain level that people, you're more likely to start working with? My clients are mostly entrepreneurs and consultants, coaches, experts, people like that. Mostly I help people who've been much like me in the corporate setting, have this amazing expertise and have decided, you know what? I want to go out on my own. I want to use my skills, my years of knowledge, all the stuff that I built up to help others. So that's why their personal brand means a lot. And so that's who I focus on. And predominantly, I love helping women because I find women and like me, they don't think they need to stand out more. They tend to not want to put themselves out there as much. And I was one of those people. So no judgment there, trust me. But, nice. but it's important because if people don't know you, they can't do business with you, right? So there's a way to stand out authentically. And for people who are scared to put themselves out online, I, it's not about you. It's your, how you're in service to help others. So that's always been my motto as a marketer, people first, right? So we're talking about other people. We're here to help other people. And that's that changes the whole narrative when you're like, oh, I don't have to talk about me. Cause here's the thing. I don't like talking about me. Remember I told you that earlier, right, hate yeah. to talk about me. So when I talk and give value, so we'll, we'll get our content, our education and all that, how they can help. Then it's so much easier, but it's not, it's also easier when they realize, oh, this is how I show up in the world. This is who I'm going to be known for. This is who I want to be known for. This is what people will know me as. And then they, I help them build all that clarity, the confidence, and then we work on their visibility and getting out there because consistency is a secret sauce. You have got to stay in the game consistently. So that's what I help my clients with. That is a challenge, staying consistent, especially early on, because early mm -hmm. on, your message is not being seen by enough yet. Yeah. So that is a challenge. And that's where that kind of segues nicely into the imposter syndrome, but it segues really strongly there because I believe gross generalization and labeling, which I don't like to do, women feel imposter syndrome more than men. If I was going to say, okay, help people in the audience just with one, two, 1500 tips, one tip, two tip, or 1500, whatever you prefer to get your mind off of this idea that you're an imposter. Yeah. What would you say? How would you help us do that? Well, first of all, like you said, we should never use that word, right? I hate the word too. I hate the strong yeah. word, but I dislike using that word. It's a cliche. And I, like I said, I'm trying to kill jargon, even though people recognize it, but I'm trying to define what it really is here. We're wired as humans. I don't care who you are to have that fear and that second guessing. That's just how we're wired. So the best way to do it is start small, but do start and stay consistent. And I had that too. When I, I coach my clients to hang out and get out there, but I told you privacy of being private and not wanting to stand online was a huge thing for me. So how I do it and how I ask people and train people to do it is just start small, give yourself a challenge. Okay. I'm going to start at least five days, do something for one minute. So for most people, it's showing up consistently online, for instance, LinkedIn. So actually for one thing, I, as an example, I started something called the 365 challenge on LinkedIn this year. I was talking to one of my friends, telling him how hard it is for me to put myself out of line, because I guess at the end of the day, you think, who am I that, you know, are people, the thing people think of are 
Do I have enough value? Are people going to listen to me? Are people going to judge me? Those are some of the common things we think with imposter syndrome. So the best way to overcome it is just to kick your fear to the curb and do the things that you're scared of. So instead of saying, I'm going to post myself on LinkedIn, I decided I'm going to post 365 consecutive days. So I think right now I'm at 62 days. And I have to tell you, once you do it, the fear doesn't ever go away, but it gets so much easier. So you have to confront the fear. And when you do, you get stronger each day. And that's what you got to do. You got to just walk outside of that fear and just start. I think that's powerful. I started doing that, but I didn't realize that is hoping erase that a little bit because I'm doing a live show every morning, Monday through Thursday. Number one, who am I to even have a message? Number two, who's going to listen? And if I get a poor comment about something, I'm going to be upset. You no, know, I was working with a gentleman who was actually part of my mastermind group. And we were just talking about the fact that we go through an entire year. Like I think in 2019, I spoke with about 75 to 80,000 people. Wow. And throughout the entire year, I probably got maybe 10 to 12 negative ratings. And this idea that you focus so much on the negative ratings, 15 of, out of all those many people, that was the focus. And I think that creates the imposter syndrome, if you will. But I like your thing, just no matter what, post. Yeah. It's a small step. You didn't yeah. ask people to write a novel or anything. You just said, just post. Yeah. Take a small step. And I think that's really useful and powerful. And I think that leads to your authentic self. Does that, does that connect those two together? Oh yeah. And my there's, so now there's 250 people in our three, in our 365 challenge. And, and I just ran a post on Sunday. How many of you are still here? Who's still posting? And about 60% are showing up daily and about 30 are doing it weekdays. And some came in saying, look, I can only do it weekdays and that's fine. Progress, not perfection, but they're still doing it. So I am realizing who I am, even though I've written it out and that's what got me the clarity, getting that validation and the feedback is the best way to figure out your voice and your value online. Cause people, we can't see the label for the jar we're in, right. Is the old saying. So when people say, Oh, they comment on your stuff then you, you see how you resonate or you don't. If a post doesn't resonate, it's not you. It could be the algorithm. It could be at that moment, the 5% it shows to doesn't see it. And that's one thing, the personal thing, like you said, I'm not taking it personally now because I've built up that resistance, so to speak, by getting 60 days into it. So I imagine another 60 days, I'll be even better. I'll never be perfect but I'll be 1% better as the Atomic Habits book says. I'm going to be 1% better. So if you can try to make that little small step, nothing will change unless something changes. And trust me, I lived in my head far too long. Mm -hmm. So I know how that yeah. is. And here's the thing. When you see negative stuff, I was just having a post about this, talking on someone's post. What happens not only if you get a negative comment, but what if you constantly keep seeing someone in your feed and for some reason, you can't put your finger word around it, but it drugs you, right? It's something about them. It's just, I don't know if it's competition or whether, here's what you do. And this is what I do and it helps. I unfollow them. So I like an out of sight, out of mind presence. And so I've heard, I think it's Seth Godin. One of some famous authors I just read, they don't ever read their reviews because they don't want to know because they don't want it to taint and get into their skin, so to speak. Sometimes it's hard to avoid those, but as much as you can stay in your lane, put your blinders on the competition is a trap. Competition sabotages a trap. So is the negative. So I'm not saying we're all going to be hundred percent positive, but it sure helps. We need that daily small doses to get us through. Right. So anything like that, we got to help. That's very useful and powerful there. Uh, took me back to the days when I just used to do that. Just do the best I can. Who cares what you say? If I'm doing the best I can, I know I'm helping the most people. Yeah. Hard to do that on social media platforms because you're supposed to respond to comments to help your algorithm things grow. Yeah. But maybe that's why you hire somebody to do that for you. <laughs> so. But there's always going to be those people. I read a quote that those people are usually happy inside or whatever. Yeah. Why are they lashing out? Why is just 10% out of 80,000 people? There's usually another motive and it's not you. It's something like they're unhappy inside their job, whatever. It's them. It comes across as you. It happens to every famous person, every person who puts themselves out there. But why would you let those 10 people stop you? when you've impacted 80,000 people last year or what, 2019, right? Yeah, yeah. So I guess that's a very powerful lesson then for 
nonprofit leaders. You're going to have people who snipe at your leadership. But if you're making a difference out there, why would you let them impact you? Exactly. And that's why bringing this full circle, knowing your authentic personal brand, okay? Maybe you're not going to be a consultant or anything, but you, everyone has a personal brand. So when you know internally your vision, your values, and then you're reminded of that, then you're hopefully on track on that right lane with your blinders on. Oh, I, I, my bigger why, or this is why I'm doing this. So you're going to have the naysayers. But when you stay on that track, knowing you're in your destination to what you want, it's going to help us stay on track and not fall off when you get a negative comment. Because we're all going to get a negative comment. Something's never, it, life's not perfect. Very much another cliche. But when I was a little girl, my mom used to tell me the saying, and I've always remembered it. And the days that it gets very disgruntled, I tell myself this inch by inch, life's a cinch, mile by mile, life's a trial. And something so silly and so simple. It, and everybody has a different saying like that. It just helps me get back on track. This too shall pass. This is not the rest of your life, this moment. I want to ask you because you mentioned Seth Godin and you mentioned James Clear's book, Atomic Habits. Catching totally off guard, and I apologize, but this could include anything that you've written or read. What would you say to your clients? Go read this. Like I said, it could include anything. If you read it, okay. if you read it, go read it. Yeah, okay. I think every high school or college senior should read How to Win Friends and Influence People. Yeah, that read, is, yeah. you know, a classic what it's I don't even remember what year it was published almost 70 80 years ago yeah I have to admit I was late to life to read it I think I only just read it five years ago after hearing about it all my life but I kept reading and underlining everything because in my DNA I've always been strong about people first customer service and it seems so silly and so obvious but it's just it's brilliant so anyway I would recommend that it's like how to get along with people basically if more of us did this we'd have a lot less combativeness and drama in the world find your why is another one mm, because when you silly. identify yep your why personal branding is perspective but just life perspective it helps you go to that big picture and i have a million marketing books that i read that most people wouldn't read but and there's some really good ones but just off the top of my head for all around i would think those two i can't think of right now all my books are on that bookshelf way over there so i'd have to go yeah. pull them out but as for this conversation those are two important ones i think simon Sinek's book know your why that's that in essence really saying know your vision know your mission Know your passion. Yeah, why you do something before what you do something, correct. Yeah, that's people want to know why you do something. So as a personal brand, why you, who are you about? Your why is who you are, but it's not about you. It's why are you doing this to help me solve my problem? And that's what I try to tell people. You have to know your internal before you're the external. But, but it's huge because people judge first by emotions, then by logic, right? So when you can connect that first, people are going to pay attention. In today's noisy world, goodness, we need to break through the noise. So when you have a narrative around your why, a bigger picture, a bigger mission, a transformative mission that you're trying to help people with, they are going to understand and pay attention a little bit better than just talking about what you do, right? Okay. So you teed it yourself up for this one. Uh -oh. Tell us why <laughs> <This> you're... <is> coming. <laughs> Tell us why you're in the business that you're in. Because I hate the fact that, or I dislike the fact that people who have a brilliant mission to share or expertise are not getting the attention they deserve, especially women. I think that we cater to too many other people and we don't put ourselves first. And I don't mean putting ourselves first in a very narcissistic way, taking care of who you are so you can help more. And there's a lot of brilliant people who are just being overshadowed, right? And so if I can come and help them own their message, that's the title of one of my talks, own your message, who, who you are matters, what you have to say matters. Like we all have an expertise and don't think that everyone else is doing it because no one else has your vision, your expertise, your experience, your talent, is all that good stuff. So I'm really passionate about giving a voice and a vision and a, a message, helping people. Because when you can have your message, because for instance, my why for five years, Five years I dreamed about leaving my job. Not that I was unhappy with it. It was a great job, but I had outgrown it. And right. I wanted, I had this internal mission to help more people, but I struggled five years, even though that's what I do, knowing who I was and why and what I do and all this. So I put band-aids on it by thinking that courses and certifications would help me find that why. And none of it did. Mm -hmm. It wasn't until I had a breakthrough moment and figured Michelle, 
who are you? So I just started writing and journaling, made this kind of whole own your message thing. I actually, it was a talk I gave and then I applied it to myself. And then I realized, oh my gosh, here's who I am and why I need and what I need to do. And so I want to help people who are struggling, women especially, knowing they have a bigger vision, but don't know how to start or feel like they don't have enough confidence or clarity. So that's why I do it because we're, it's called brand your brilliance. I want to help people brand their brilliance. Okay. I don't want to lose that thought, but I want to ask you another thought. So you got your, your why and where you want to go. Who is a great client for you? The red carpet client. Who do you want to work with? My ideal clients. I love helping women, but I I don't discriminate men. I have helped. My client is typically a women executive or professional, someone who's just worked in their field a long time. And has insatiable desire to help other people and start their own business and do, you know, consulting, coaching, what have you. And so I help them come together. They come to me and they figure out who I am, what I am. So we work on their branding, their internal, external branding. Then we set them up with marketing and visibility. I, you know, I'm bringing my PR experience and how to get visibility these days. So ideally it's people who want to make a bigger, have a bigger mission and message, but don't know where to start. They're uncertain because they don't know how to do any of this or they are scared to take that step. So I help them with both. So it sounds like that you're able to grow with the customer that you're working with, the client you're working with from, I don't know what my mission is. Do I know what my yes. mission is? I'm branded. Okay. Now I have a PR person who can help me through the PR to help me figure out how to get it out there a little bit better. Yeah. They're like, you could call them like going from a closet expert when knows about them to being sought after. And, and I don't even like to call it PR these days because PR to me is so corporate and one-sided back 20 years ago before the internet and all the social media existed and podcasts and all these talks, it was one-sided. And so now I call it visibility because there's ample opportunity to get visibility. So we work on like their pitch deck, their expert bios, all that stuff. And then we work on what I call the engagement ladder. You're not going to land on USA Today or the, or Good Morning America the first day, right? So you start small, you start getting your reps in, and then you just build it up and it just keeps going. It's a chain reaction. Yeah, Someone sees yeah. you here and it just explodes. So we work on that. But before you get to there, you know, everyone's to go, I want to be on USA Today. I want to be on Good Morning America, whatever. You cannot get there that day. So you start figuring out your foundational stuff. Then you get your marketing to amplify it, magnify it. And then we get to the visibility. So it's a wonderful learning process. It doesn't happen overnight, but gosh, it's fun. Because when you get that clarity and the confidence and you can talk about confidently who you are and how you serve people, it's transformative. And that's what I'm trying to do. Transform, transform lives. Absolutely love that. No, one of the people I share is Dr. Edward Demings, and he's considered the father of quality management if, for mm-hmm. those of people who are not familiar with him. And he has rules. He says that all managers should look at. And one of them is don't use slogans. Throw the slogans out. So I'm going to ask you off the top of your head again, what slogans would you throw out and what, how would you, what would you use to replace them? I guess I would know, he needs to know more about what slogans he means and some examples. I'm just, if you want to call slogans jargon, jargon. that would yeah. jargon. Jargon to me, I actually funny made a list a while ago, like a year ago, my jargon list. I try not to, you see a lot of websites and B2B like synergy. And here's the thing for a personal brand and people start using jargon or slogans, we pick, we don't know who we are. So we start looking at everyone else for affirmative who, you know, for affirmation, who should I be when you don't listen to yourself? And have you noticed how many websites sound the same? So that is my pet peeve. So I say, don't sound like everyone else and don't have jargon, but as far as slogans, I'm okay with a slogan. I don't even like the word slogan. I would say I try to make, I try, I, we work on a brand positioning message or a personal brand statement rather. Okay. And so people know what they do in a nutshell. And so it's not a jargon. It's not a slogan. It's basically who you are and what you do mostly and why you do it. And that's what I work on and help people with. Okay. Let me go because you said a lot of people use the same language. Yes. And I'm guilty of that to some degree more than I want to admit that I'm guilty of it too, obviously. But I'm thinking, if I take a word like authenticity and define it, it's going to be different for everybody. So therefore you're going to have a different website, I would think. 
Yeah, here's the thing. I wouldn't try not, I try not to, even though I have it in my definition on my LinkedIn banner, I try not to talk in jargon. You just talk in real thing. And so I have a whole process. I bring people through when you talk in the language of your ideal client and use their words, I don't like conversationally how you and I would talk. That's how I would put on my website in a very professional way, of course, but you don't sit here, you and I, and talk in synergy and I can't even think of my jargon words because I've tried to get them out of my head, but we don't talk in jargon, you and I, even when we have used those figures of speech, you and I both qualified and with, it's a cliche, it's a figure of speech, but we don't like using them. But in the context of human language, we do, but at least you and I clarify that. But anyway, so just use your customer's language and they will completely relate to you and it will be, um, quote, authentic to them. In the work of personal branding, how much work do you do helping someone understand the conversation they should be having? You know, the, I'm starting to say the chats you should be having. If you're making a sales call on somebody, it should be a chat. It shouldn't be a conversation. It shouldn't be a sales pitch. That's what I'm thinking. It, let's just chat. Okay. Yeah. If you do it right and you show up, people know you're the show, you know, who you are, the go-to person, because you're completely defined and differentiated yourself. And then you're delivering so much of your thought leadership in the form of content, you're giving value, which value, I'm going to put a disclaimer, it's another cliche word, mm. value to me is just education, you're sharing your expertise for others. When you keep doing that consistently, that's another jargon word, but it's one of my favorites, people are, you're going to be known as a go to people are going to start the pull comes to you, you don't have to push to people, they're going to be coming to you. So I just say you have to show up and start talking about what you're known for. And it does. And then when you do get in front of someone, you ask them about their problems. You're not selling them. You're just talking to them like you would. That's what I do. I love sales calls. And I don't even like to call them sales calls. We just talk, right? And I'll say, here's what I'm hearing. Here's how I think I can help you. And I'll either share them the information. So it's never that way. I'm not a salesy person. I always like to say, we have to make sure we're a fit. And usually if you've articulated yourself well online, and giving them enough value, they're already sold. How would you suggest like a CEO of a, let's just pick, I mostly, most of my clients are in the educational mm-hmm. space. They have to sell their team on creating a safe center or safe school, being enrolled and being engaged. They have to sell their team. What's the best way I guess at that point, here's my question. At that point, you're putting in that person's personal brand. That's the person's going to cause that vision to come true. Is that the type of work that you do as well? So in other words, if I'm giving a speech, my personal brand shows up where the people feel it and want to work with me. Yeah. I think of personal branding as your online reputation and thought leadership, which another cliche, I help people define who, what they want to be known for. And then in their content strategy and their thought leadership, we define for them. We'll talk about what they want to talk about, but most importantly, we'll get to the heart of who they serve and what are the problems our clients are having. So you show up, it's a natural fit. People are like, oh, wow, I need to know this person. So yes, we work on thought leadership. We work on speeches. We work on podcast, you know, pitching and topics. So if that's what you meant, I think, I don't know if that's exactly what you meant, but that's what I do. Yeah, it was because I guess I'm asking also, okay, I got my professional brand, but in order for my professional brand to really make a difference, my personal brand has to be strong. Yeah. Order, is that what? Yeah. Personal brand and professional brand are to me the same thing because you, how you show up, a personal brand is another name for your professional brand. So, cause I'm talking about a personal brand uh-huh. in the context of the professional setting. So some people call it professional brand, but it's a prefer- per- personal professional brand is what I mean. Okay, that's real, gives me a real sense of clarity and I bet it does for the audience. What you're saying is the personal brand is how you drive your professional brand. They're the same thing. Yeah, and I'm sorry if I wasn't clear earlier. No, that's no, no. what I. That's how I define it. Sometimes Other you have to say things 10 different ways for me to catch it. You and <laughs> me both. <laughs> that's how they say we have to keep putting ourselves out there because it could take sometimes people 10 times, to, like you said, to do mm-hmm. it. And so that's why consistency is huge. But no, it's the same thing to me. And I look at a personal brand as your professional security. The profession, it's defining you want to know who you are. So I don't care if you're going to look for another job. People know you because you have defined who you are and you show up and help them. And so, sure, they're going to know to know who you are and hire you or whatever, because 
you're known and you're defined and they know you're the go-to person. Now, your story is, I don't want to say that, but it's not as average. Okay, it's the average person's story, just hearing it. And we don't want to cross that line of going and getting too much personal information. But there's some level of passion there. When I hear your story, that makes me think, okay, it makes me want to ask you, why are you so passionate about this personal branding issue? Because I know you might say it's because I guess I didn't articulate or greatly articulate the five years I struggled that it sounds and I even would tell myself during those five years this is that in the scheme of life this isn't a problem but yeah it is when you have no identity or know what you want to do you want to change your life or have a calling to do something different and you don't know every day you just walk around and you don't know which way to go to me that's like being lost in the desert and that's how i would call myself sometimes so mm. i don't want to i want to save people that time and tears there were tears of frustration yeah. of being the go-to person so that when they can articulate gosh i have a calling i want to step out of my job or whatever and do something else but i don't know how to do it I was uncertain and I thought these courses and certifications while they educated me great. I didn't need that. I needed to find someone who could say this, I've been there before and I'm here to help you. I don't want you to waste five years of your life doing it. So if that makes sense, and I know that sounds a bit narcissistic, but I'm using my story as a catalyst to help others. No, that's why else do we do things? Because it's yeah. our story that yeah. helps us do things. And it, yeah. I asked that question because in my mind, five years of being stuck in a job you know, how many people are out there stuck for 30 years? Yeah, in, yeah. In a job, and, but they, you didn't give up. You just realized how much pain that was for you. And I, so. to be honest, I've always been in marketing and have a master's in PR. And I would look at other things like, well, maybe I don't need to stay in this. Maybe I'm, my calling's being X, Y, Z. So I looked and invested into other things I'm not going to mention professionally, but it yeah. just, it wasn't me. So I, in, I internally, and I wasted a lot of time and money too. Yeah in anguish thinking, but in it, I started also at, during that time I was journaling at 750words.com. I highly recommend that. It's a great tool. And I pay $5 a month to be a member and it's kept all my digital diary, so to speak, all those years. But even though I was regurgitating all that stuff out, I still didn't put the pieces together until I made that talk in 2019. And, it, and then I opened it up again. I'm like, oh my gosh, I can apply this to me. And so when I was trying to help others own their message, I wasn't owning mine. But then after I did that talk and it was so well received, I put myself through it and it was so clear. And so then I realized later that year, I submitted and on May 31st, I believe, I remember the day well, I yeah. submitted my resignation. Yes. And, and then I left my job July 31st, I'm sorry, January 31st, 2020. Not the best um, of times, but yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And I was going to take a sabbatical and then the world forced me to take a sabbatical. But here's the thing. I was also during that time, word of mouth, doing marketing consulting on the side. So I knew that I loved helping people, but I didn't connect the dots. So I struggled with who am I going to help? So anyway, I know people, it's a universal thing to struggle, but no one should struggle for that long. And no course will help you unless you know who the heck you are and what you want to do. So I figured out with my, my own your message thing, how to mm -hmm hopefully help people overcome that. Cool. So one of my last 15,000 questions for you. When you look at coaching, and I think people mm -hmm. need to be coached. So I have three coaches that I use. If you were to say, okay, here's three coaches that I think, let me rephrase it. Here's three coaches that I want to use. Maybe you're not using them. Maybe you are using them, but here's three coaches or four coaches that would help me in my career. Who would those coaches be? Yeah, that's a great question. First of all, looking back, I would have probably picked a, instead of investing all that money in courses, I wasn't ready for some of them. Some of them I never finished because I wasn't a fit. I would invest in a coach for sure, but like a business coach to get your business in check. Um, okay. Some people say life coaching. I'm, I've helped life coaches, but I've never used one, but those seem beneficial. And I would think like a messaging coach. If you have a struggle, a personal brand coach, a messaging coach, someone can help you get your own messaging out because it's near impossible. And I'm going to tell you another secret about me. Even though I do that for people, I use my friends who are, do what I do. I have to run my stuff by them too, because I need a coach too. I think there's a Bill Gates line quote that says, everyone needs a coach. Look at Tom Brady, the bit greatest of all time. All these people have coaches. We all need another person to help us see who we are and have that feedback. 
So although I've run my stuff through my own messaging framework, I use my, my friends and colleagues to bounce off. So messaging or personal brand coach to figure out your brand identity, whoever that might be, and a business coach for sure. Now, okay. if you're having a hard time and exercise in life, health coach might be good from a professional business standpoint, a business coach and a identity coach. Now, sometimes you can find one that do both, but we just need someone to talk to and keep us accountable and motivate us for sure. Not that I'm his biggest fan, but I like what Tiger Woods said about coaching. You know, he had a swing coach, he had a putting coach, he had a chipping coach, yeah. and he has a head coach, I forget what he calls him. So you have all those coaches and that's why he's so successful, yeah. or has as much money as he had or has. Coaching, mastermind, maybe the same thing in your head, in your mm-hmm. mind. Mastermind group. Who would be in your mastermind group? Yeah, it doesn't matter. Oh, I'm one of her biggest fans, Sarah Blakely of Spanx. She she went to Florida State, was there when I was there. And self-made, I think she's one of the first self-made billionaires. And she is a true definition of an authentic personal brand. If you follow her on Instagram, which I do, it's hilarious. She shares her life and she's hilarious, but then she shares important wisdom for women. She's a passionate supporter of women and families and entrepreneurship. So definitely would want to include her. And I just think I'd have to think just some of the past strong leaders of our world, women and men, probably Mm -hmm. no more than five or six, um, but also people just like me, because I don't think just because someone's famous doesn't mean they're have all the answers to. And that's what I'm trying to tell my clients and your listeners and your audience. There are brilliant people all around us, right? And we need to get that out there. So just because someone's not known does not mean they're brilliant and they have wise words to share. So I would probably try to find some people who aren't and learn from them as well. Cool. And that's my mastermind group is full. So that's good advice. I'll follow that advice. I do it already. So I would do that. I want to ask you about your clubhouse. Uh, yes. Do you have a room on clubhouse that you share? And if so, yes. or I th- I, we're connected through clubhouse, right? That's correct. Yes. Yeah. But don't tell anybody that because I don't <laughs> like the Mac or the iOS stuff. And oh, iPad. Yes. That's the only reason I got on. <laughs> I said, oh, oh yeah. But the new iPad. And so let me see what they do. And then I found them. So tell me about your rooms. Where if someone goes on, they're going to find you and yes. hear some of the wisdom that you share. Yes. Thank you so much. I love that we did meet on Clubhouse. In fact, I've met brilliant, amazing, just smart, insightful people there. So I highly recommend people check it out. Listening to the town hall from the founders every Sunday, they did confirm they're working on an Android version, which makes me happy too. Yes. I do have <laughs> friends who are an Android. So I hope that's the next couple months. So I have a weekly show called the Personal Branding Clubhouse, and it's Wednesdays at 11 a.m. Eastern. And every week I bring someone on, a guest speaker, and we talk about some aspect on how to, of a speaker or topic on how to grow your personal brand. That's our tagline, how to grow your personal brand. In fact, tomorrow's matter is how to a clubhouse can grow your personal brand. And mm-hmm. that's a great way to, to grow, to, I have, a, I've, working on a blog post on how many ways it is. I, I was on, I became a clubhouse member in December and since January, I've either I've hosted or moderated weekly. And some people say, Oh, it's a time it just takes too much time. Not in, if you're strategic and intentional. And to me, you should be strategic by becoming the thought leader and the go-to by hosting your own room. Okay. Being consistently weekly showing up. That's done great for my brand and to help me connect to people like you. And the beauty of it is you're in that moment, right? So people can fast track their no trust. And so what I always do, it's a little bit harder when I'm hosting, but when I'm in a room, I'll screenshot all these people. And then, cause you know how there's no LinkedIn profile. There's right. only Twitter and Instagram. So yeah. I try to just capture that person so I can stay focused on the topic. And then after I make a point of going to connect with these people, and people are very receptive. You just say, hey, it was great to see you, talk with you, chat with you in Clubhouse today. And I've started many conversations out. I try to go in there three hours a week. It's not crazy. Because I yeah. have work to do. That's know? a good game plan. I'm, yeah. Again, just something I learned because that's, I like when I, you were speaking, I think, and I said, that res- I like that. And that's when I, 
immediately went to the Instagram and lost track of what everybody else was doing. But I think that's I think that's useful to yeah. just screenshot it and come back to it. So that's a good thing. So yeah, especially for LinkedIn, because you're not going to have that instant connection. Like exactly, LinkedIn. exactly. Now you're saying you're, it's Wednesdays at 9 or 11? It's at 11 a.m. Eastern. 11, so it's um, not, yeah, yeah. not quite my time yet. Yeah, so we do that weekly. And tomorrow, I know we're taping this, so who knows when this will go live. But it's Wednesdays at 11 a.m. And so I work on different amazing people in personal branding. And I've had about the story. We've done content, video. Last week was about authentic personal branding. So I try to give people actionable things. And the beauty about mine is after everyone, I take good notes. We can't record it. So I try to take some really good notes. And I make a carousel slider on LinkedIn after each one as a recap. And that helps me help people who can't be there. And it just gives me the content for the day. And people have been very receptive and appreciative of that as well. We're well, talking about the branding. My challenge has been with the clubhouse, but you just erased it. It seemed like it's more of a B to C connection, but yes. it really is a B to B connection. If you do what it, you just it could be either. You got the built-in Instagram crowd, and then you know a lot of people. I really, in fact, I would love to be on the town hall and ask him if I'll ever put a LinkedIn profile because he people will go ahead and put their LinkedIn profiles, but. I see a split. So it just depends on who your audience is. You know, the platform that's right for you is where your audience is and where you enjoy being. And for me, it's LinkedIn and Clubhouse. I don't ever post on Instagram that much, but it could be either. And that's the thing. There's any con, there's a B2C and a B2B audience on LinkedIn. I mean, heck, Bill Gates was just on LinkedIn on yeah. uh, Clubhouse last week, right? Yeah. yeah. Mark Zuckerberg's on it. Elon Musk. It's amazing. I'm not saying they're on it all the time, but if they're on it, that kind of validates it, at least yeah. for now. Especially those guys are brilliant. They've gotten yeah. there and they're still reaching out to connecting. Yeah. So now I let's say somebody wants to hire you as their personal branding coach or mm -hmm. as your company, your services. How do they get a hold of you? Yeah, thank you. My website is michellegriffinmedia.com. You can find me there. You can find me on LinkedIn. I'm on all the platforms, but the best way is find me on my website, michellegriffinmedia.com. I'm also going to be posting or launching my podcast in about six weeks called Brand Your Brilliance. We'll be focusing on personal branding for women entrepreneurs specifically and exclusively. So I'm excited about that. So hopefully people will eventually find me there too. But yeah, my website, Michelle Griffin Media, and I love connecting on Clubhouse and LinkedIn. So I'd love to meet anyone here who wants to connect. Okay, yeah, and it is recorded, but it's going to make his comeback. It's going to recycle in every three or so months. We're going to say, hey, don't forget about this. Go back to it. So right. we're going to have get a chance to really get to that. Hopefully you'll find some good value out of the podcast itself so that you could, you'll share it to, to your folks. I think that the value of having a personal branding coach, that's what I'm referring to you now, having that value seems is a big part of your business world. And I hope people reach out to you for that. I highly Thank recommend you. it. I am going to include, which I hadn't, when winning friends and influence. I've, <laughs> the, the yeah, how to win people. friends and influence people. Yeah. Yes, and I'll stand by. You can get it for $5 on Amazon. Oh, you, you can, yeah, you can get it for $5 on Amazon, but I think it's in or the public domain. The library. So, yeah. yeah, or yeah. public domain. You're probably right too. It's a classic. It's a great read. So we all need to see. I'll include that into the book list of recommended great. books. Um, what I'm doing is if you have an article that you've written that you want mm -hmm. to post it there, let's do that too. Sure. Uh, my mission is to curate information so people can learn things and be better and make the work life better. I love so that. I love that you're a curator too, because yeah. I also tell my clients, if you can't always comment, create content, nothing better than curating excellent content. Because we can't keep it up with it all. There's no yeah. way possible. Yeah. That's it. That's it. With that, I'll say thank you very much. And it's been a very educational time. You've taken me personally out of some of my paradigms as far as you know, what I have to do in order to be better. Like I said at the start, I'm still in this for myself. Oh, but I'm great. sure that people listening to it can start, can start saying, yeah, I understand how that type of coach can help me. Yes. Thank you, Glenn. I cannot thank you enough. I owe social media to how we've connected and I value the connection and I value even greater the time and chance to be invited. Thank you so much that I get to articulate what true, authentic, professional, personal branding is. So, well, you're welcome. You spoke to me and I said, that's what yeah. I need. So I'm sure other people need that too. So I thank you so very much. Thank you again. Talk to All you right. soon. All thank right. you. Hold on. Let me turn off the like I said, technology in me. 